So once again, welcome to the NGO Committee on the Family New York's parallel <laughs> event in conjunction with the 66th Annual Commission on the Status of Women um, on the importance of family remittances in alleviating poverty and achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. My name is Ryan Coe, and I am the co-chair of the NGO Committee on the Family in New York. We have other members of the Executive Committee with us today, including Benjamin Freer, who is my co-chair, uh, Lynn Walsh, Marilyn Kanelsky, Sean Heakin Kennedy, um, and uh, I'm sure we have others that have joined, but I cannot see them right now. At any rate, we are here, um, and the NGO Committee on the Family, mm -hmm. as you all know, is committed to promoting the family as the fundamental group unit of society. Um, and to show the different ways in which the family underscores all of the sustainable development goals. Um, today's subject is actually an interesting one for me personally. I used to live in the Philippines, and it was where I first became familiar with the concept of remittances and family remittances. Um, the, in, in Manila itself, they have a ring road and to get pretty much anywhere you have to go on this ring road and along the ring road there was actually a department of family remittances um and so i was curious i didn't really understand what that was at the time and so i would ask people and it turns out that there are a not a million actually more than a million overseas foreign workers that are filipino whether they're working as domestic help um which uh, a lot of filipino women do or as or as uh, merchant marines. Two thirds of the world's merchant marines are actually Filipinos. Um, that they, a lot of people work outside of the Philippines and send money back in. Um, and I saw firsthand some of the interesting things that that does both to society, to economy, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of instances, for example, in which uh, extended family comes into play where they're trying to help uh, a mother raise her children because she's overseas working. So the aunts and the grandmas are working with the children themselves. Um, there's interesting other cultural things. Uh, just as an example, um, I represent Latter-day Saint Charities, which is the humanitarian organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, we have our Sabbath on Sunday, typically speaking. We'll go to church on Sundays. Uh, however, in Hong Kong, due to the abundance of overseas foreign workers, primarily Filipinas that are working in Hong Kong, they have church every single day of the week um, so that they can accommodate different schedules for different women that are working. So they'll have church on Wednesday for those uh, uh, overseas foreign workers who have church, who have Wednesday as their day off, et cetera. Um, but this this idea of remittances is a very strong one. Um, according to the World Bank, emigrants' remittances are expected to reach 774 billion in 2022, which is a humongous number. Um, and it's not just Filipino overseas foreign workers, but it's millions of other people that are working around the world. Um, we had mentioned in our last meeting that the Filipino permanent representative would be speaking to us today. Uh, he is unable to do so due to commitments with the Commission on the Status of Women, but he was able to submit a video, a pre-recorded statement for us, and so we're going to begin today's meeting by listening to that and watching that. So if you give me two seconds, I will share my screen, uh, and we can see that from Ambassador Manalo. Excellencies, colleagues, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's side event on the importance of family remittances in alleviating poverty and achieving the SDGs. First and foremost, I wish to thank the NGO Committee on Family for organizing this important event. I'm also pleased to see the participation of Ms. Vincencina Santoro of the American Family Association of New York as well as that of Mr. Pedro de Vasconcelos, head of the financing facility for remittances of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, our active partner on the matter of family remittances. The Philippines has long recognized the human face of migration and the positive contribution of migrants 
to sustainable development, including through remittances. Remittances have a transformative impact across all the sustainable development goals. They support long-term development strategies, particularly on poverty eradication and access to basic services at the household level. They also foster local investments that encourage entrepreneurship and financial inclusion, especially in rural areas of developing countries where poverty rates are the highest. In 2021, the World Bank expected remittance flows to low- and middle-income countries to reach U.S. $589 billion, which is a 7.3% increase from 2020. This is more than three times the global official development assistance and, excluding China, more than 50% higher than the global foreign direct investment. A recent World Bank report also noted that migrants had stepped up support to their families, especially in countries affected by the COVID-19 Delta variant, which in turn helped promote economic activity and employment. Despite the massive repatriation of over a million Filipinos returning to the Philippines since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Philippines remains the fourth largest recipient of remittances globally. In fact, the Central Bank of the Philippines reported a record high of personal remittances from overseas Filipino workers in the amount of 34.884 billion US dollars, which represents 8.9% of the country's GDP. The sustained growth in personal remittances reflected a pickup in the deployment of overseas Filipino workers. Strong demand for OFWs amid the reopening of host economies to foreign workers and the continued shift to digital support that facilitated inward transfer of remittances. Our advocacy in keeping the continuous flows of remittances is focused on maximizing the benefits to senders and receivers of remittances. We have continuously supported initiatives that mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on remittance flows, migrants, members of the diaspora communities and the families, communities and economies that rely on receiving remittances. In April 2021, the Philippines reached a milestone in our banking history with the creation of the Overseas Filipino Bank as the first branchless, digital-only bank. This bank is dedicated to providing financial products and services tailored to the requirements of overseas Filipinos. Aside from the deposit savings accounts, the OF Bank digital services include fund transfers, bills payments, and applications for multi-purpose loans. In addition, the Digital Payment Transformation Roadmap 2020 to 2023 of the Central Bank of the Philippines also promotes financial inclusion and digitalization of payments. This roadmap is anchored on three pillars. First, digital payment streams. Second, digital finance infrastructure. And third, digital governance standards with two primary objectives, to expand financial inclusion to 70% of Filipino adults and to encourage innovations which will boost real-time payments. We are seeing the results of our efforts in supporting remittance flows. The Philippines is identified in a recent World Bank report as having the lowest remittance fees in the East Asia and the Pacific region. But what really matters most to the overseas Filipino workers are the individual amounts regularly and consistently sent back home to their families. These amounts represent 60% of total household income and if leveraged properly can effectively improve the living standards of migrants' communities of origin. At this juncture, I also wish to recall the resolution declaring 16 June as the International Day of Family Remittances, which the Philippines, along with Guatemala, Madagascar, and Algeria, in partnership with the International Fund for Agricultural Development, or IFAD, championed in 2018. The resolution recognizes the link between remittances and sustainable development, 
and acknowledges the fundamental contribution of migrant workers to the well-being of their families and communities of origin. Every year, the Philippines also spearheads the commemoration of this International Day as a fitting tribute to the hard work and sacrifices of overseas Filipino workers who send remittances to improve the lives of their families and to create a better future for their children. I look forward to commemorating with all of you the International Day of Family Remittances. Thank you. Am I sharing still or did I stop the sharing? Okay, I'm good to go. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, His Excellency Ambassador Enrique Manalo for his remarks and for his willingness to do that. And to thank Rosalind, his assistant, who has been working with me on getting that video um, to us to share with you. Um, as you can see from the ambassador, the scope of remittances is incredible. Uh, in the Philippines, but many other countries benefit from this idea of remittances to their, to their citizens. So we will now move on to the presentation portion of our meeting today. Our first speaker is going to be Ms. Vinny Santoro. Vinny is also a member of the executive committee. And so I did not mention her earlier when I was talking about the executive committee because I was going to introduce her as a speaker. She has been with the committee for as long as I've been with the committee and I've known Vinny for many years. She is a definitely a uh, economist at heart. Um, and as such, she's been working as our treasurer. Uh, she really likes the money uh, and knowing the money flows and knowing where the money goes, if you can say. Uh, she worked for JP Morgan as part of her career. She's currently with the American Family Association of New York, and she has a lot of vested interest in this topic. As part of her remarks, she'll be introducing our other speaker, who is Mr. Pedro de Vasconcelos. As the ambassador said, he is the head of financing facility for remittances at IFAD in Rome. Uh, so Vinny, we'll turn the time over to you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Ryan. That's a very nice introduction. Um, as the Filipino ambassador uh, just uh, recognized, uh, at least briefly, um, we cannot really underestimate the importance of immigrants' remittances. And uh, the purpose of this meeting is to uh, make both EFID better known and its role in developing uh, immigrants' remittances. But um, it's always well to put into some sort of personal perspective that. Uh, uh, these immigrants' remittances also come at a great personal cost. Uh, families have to be separated and sometimes for many years while um, the major breadwinner uh, wor works uh, overseas or in some other uh, country. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the economic importance um, should be stressed a lot more. And um, together with the ambassador, I'm going to throw around a few figures uh, uh, for you to digest, uh, to give a more global uh, feel for the importance of, uh, of remittances. But it was a decent, like, I don't know, 10 minute wait. What happened? Somebody was unmuted. I muted them. Okay. Um, well, globally, uh, many families are affected uh, by uh, uh, remittances. And according to uh, some data that has been compiled by the uh, by DESA, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the UN, uh, there were an estimated 280 million persons living in a country not of their birth in 2020. These are the migrants. In 2021, immigrants' remittances totally amounted to $751 billion. Uh, this is money sent to families directly and this figure is projected by the World Bank uh, to rise to 774 billion uh, this year. The trillion dollar mark may not be too far off. Remittances have been resilient and consistent, uh, declining only very little, 1.7% uh, in pandemic year 2020, uh, especially when compared with other international uh, capital flows. 
Uh, most remittances are destined for rural agricultural areas in uh, lower to middle income countries. Uh, and uh, these uh, account for about uh, three quarters of the uh, total pool of remittances. Uh, I think the ambassador gave the same number, 589 billion, uh, which is also compiled by the, uh, by the World Bank. Uh, now I have to say when it comes to um, remittances, uh, in compiling the SDGs, the UN merely took note of, uh, in SDG 10, of how expensive it is for uh, migrants to send money home. Uh, however, uh, this uh, uh, number, uh, they have estimated that they would like to see the cost of remittances drop down to uh, th uh, 3%. Uh, however, right now it is 6.3%. Again, this is a compilation by the World Bank, uh, but that percentage has been coming down steadily. In 2017, for example, uh, the cost of sending a typical remittance and a typical remittance um, has been designated as $200 at, at a clip. So uh, that cost 7.5% to send in 2017. So it's come down quite a bit, but still uh, there's farther to go. However, progress has been made and even during uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, past two years of, of um, pandemic, uh, what happened was that uh, mobile banking uh, took off and that has contributed to some extent to lowering overall uh, the cost of remitting, remitting uh, funds, uh, funds abroad. Um, it is worth noting that immigrants' remittances far exceed uh, both foreign aid and foreign investment. Uh, destined for uh, the poorer countries. Um, in this case, uh, it's the poor on their own, taking themselves out of poverty. When we look at foreign aid, uh, as measured by the uh, OECD's uh, Development Assistance Committee, um, total foreign aid last year totaled $161 billion. Uh, and uh, the United States was by far the biggest, but nonetheless did not achieve uh, the, uh, uh, another SDG target to have developed countries uh, uh, disperse 0.7% of uh, GDP in foreign aid. However, only six countries uh, are able to do that and uh, the United States uh, is only at 0.3. However, uh, it should be noted that uh, the figure is really arbitrary. There's no rational basis for it. Uh, it's a completely arbitrary number and a percentage does not solve poverty. Nonetheless, it's in the SDGs. Real money is what solves poverty. As for uh, foreign direct investment, uh, capital does move into the lower and middle income countries as well uh, as companies find opportunities. Um, such investment does bring in new technology and creates jobs However, uh, these industries are localized and do not necessarily benefit a much wider population. According to UNCTAD, uh, which compiles annual data on uh, cross-border capital flows, uh, an estimated $24 billion went to lesser developed countries in 2020 out of 1 trillion globally. And uh, globally, uh, the pandemic hit these cross-border capital flows in a big way, they were down 35% um, uh, in 2020 compared with the year before. And this was the lowest in uh, many, many years. So uh, compared with 750 billion for global remittances, uh, foreign aid of 161 and foreign investment of 30 billion pale in comparison in my view. But um, let's look at a few countries to see how important uh, remittances are uh, in terms of the overall economy. Um, the largest remittance amounts usually go to the most populous countries. Thus, uh, the top two recipients in dollar amounts are India, uh, which received $87 billion last year, and China, which received $53 billion. Uh, following that, um, uh, also significant Mexico. Mexico uh, received $53 billion. Uh, the Philippines, as the ambassador uh, indicated, 
36 billion and indeed is the fourth largest, uh, followed by Egypt, which received 35, and that rounds up the top five uh, recipients. Uh, relatively speaking, remittances are much more important to smaller countries uh, where they account for a significant share of total uh, GDP. In uh, 2021, for example, there were 10 countries where remittances accounted for 20% or more of GDP. Uh, if we take Lebanon, which has been hit by many, many crises uh, recently, uh, remittances there last year accounted for a whopping 35% of GDP. So here in the United States, um, our southern border, as everyone knows, has been uh, besieged by um, caravans of people originating for the most part in Central America. When we look at remittances sent home to these countries, they account for about a quarter of GDP, for example, in Honduras and El Salvador, and that is really considerable. In New York City, the largest immigrant group is from the Dominican Republic. That country received $10.5 billion in remittances last year, equal to nearly 12% of their GDP. Enter IFAD. Within the UN system, there is one entity, in my view, that truly understands the importance of remittances, and that is IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development. IFAD is one of the 25 or so UN specialized agencies, perhaps uh, not as well known as uh, UNICEF or UN Women, but we intend to correct that today. Uh, IFAD is uh, one of the three food related UN agencies, uh, along with the Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, uh, and the World Food Program, uh, which uh, all three are based in Rome, Italy. And what a better place to locate uh, entities that have to do with agriculture and food. So according to IFAD, an estimated 750 to 800 million people globally benefit from remittances, uh, just over 10% of world population. Most of the recipients live in uh, areas uh, in lower and middle income countries uh, where farming predominates and um, most recipients are women in rural areas. Now, once families receive these funds uh, from abroad, from their uh, breadwinner working overseas, uh, they can decide for themselves how money should be spent, more food, better clothing, medical care, education for girls who otherwise might not get an education, home improvements, building a new home, uh, starting a business, or even pooling funds together with other recipients for community development projects such as uh, building a school or a clinic. Uh, this is true empowerment of women and uh, real community uh, development. In recognition of the importance of remittances, um, the EFOD Governing Council in 2015 um, declared June 16th to be the International Day of Family Remittances. Uh, subsequently, the UN General Assembly also adopted a similar resolution. So now we can all celebrate uh, June 16th. IFAD works in rural areas of poor countries and finances agricultural products of various uh, projects of various kinds. Um, long ago, IFAD noted all the funds coming in via remittances and over time has developed financial and other projects to leverage these funds uh, for both personal and community benefit. Um, to give us a good understanding of what some of these programs and projects are, we are delighted uh, to have Pedro de Vasconcelos, who is head of the financing facility for remittances uh, at IFAD. Uh, Pedro has had a long and distinguished career at IFAD, uh, is a true expert in all aspects of remittances, and is responsible for EFOD's publication, uh, Sending Money Home. Uh, Pedro joins us uh, from EFOD headquarters in Rome. And this is the first time the Family NGO Committee has had anyone speak to us from Italy, although once we did have somebody from Paris. So um, 
uh, we are grateful to Pedro for delaying his supper, given the time difference, uh, in order to be with us and to tell us about IFAD's uh, endeavors to lower, um, uh, to leveraging rather family remittances that um, play such an important role in alleviating poverty, empowering women, and helping uh, the world achieve the SDGs and the reduction of uh, global poverty. Pedro, thank you. Gracias, gracia for being with us tonight. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this kind introduction. It's always a good time to discuss what 1 billion people on earth do uh, to support their family members. So uh, again, it's an honor and a, and a privilege to be here with you today and try to share some of the experiences that IFAD has, as well as uh, some, maybe some points to, to reflect. You already mentioned some of the things that I wanted to, to say, but I think uh, it, it's worth repeating in order to put things into, into context. Uh, you did rightfully say that the, there's actually 200 million, uh, 200 million migrants today that send money to their families back home. And the beneficiaries, it is estimated, it's around 800 million. So it's 1 billion people uh, sending. And, and this is happening as we speak. Uh, during this event today, uh, I did a quick calculation and 100 million will be sent while we're having this, this meeting. This is how it translates on the importance that this flows has for so many. It's going, it's live. They don't wait to the end of the year to do it. This is a real phenomenon that has been going on for decades. It's been, as we say, hidden in plain sight because this is happening. There is uh, no glory in doing that. Uh, people are just supporting their families. They don't advertise it. And to the point that 20 years ago, our remittances were unaccounted for. Central banks could not tell you about that. Uh, no one knew how to calculate. Very few people knew about the existence of that, except the migrants themselves. So uh, we are a very long way from that now in 2022. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of things that could be done have not done, been done yet. And, and one has to do also with the understanding of what these uh, remittances are. Migrants, uh, migra it starts with migration. Migration today is very different than from 100 years ago where entire families would leave. Today, uh, the, the, the economic issues that many families um, go through in their countries of origin uh, pushes oftentimes that one member needs to leave to provide for their family. And so they will go, they will go away. Uh, to find jobs that can go from rural areas to cities, sometimes by passing the cities and going abroad. And, and this has accumulated and it's become a reality. We, we often say that for at least for a long time that uh, the remittances uh, has been, is the human face of globalization. And in many ways, this is true. We like to say, however, that it's, uh, uh, the remittances are more of a human story or a family story for that matter because it is, that's exactly what it is. Uh, all these people sending. And, and of course, uh, the migrant contributes in many ways. In kind, financially, the most known is the financial, the 200 million migrants sending their remittances home. And that's, to developing countries is the equivalent of half a trillion dollars. It's more than that, so, but it's a big number that, that sticks. Uh, and they also invest in other ways. The diaspora invests in other products, which is not called remittances, which is called diaspora investment. And, and, and this also contributes significantly. But what we realize is that it's a lot of money. However, the, the, the real importance here is not in the trillions or the, the billions that are sent, but the $200. That's the average amount that one migrant will send to their family members uh, back home on an average 10 times a year. So a little bit more than once a month. This is on average, obviously, obviously in some regions a little bit more, in some regions a bit less, but the average will give you that. And, uh, and this has been going on for, for, uh, for a long time. Uh, and the ways of finding to, to look available to many of these people to send remittances um, has been very torturous over the years. Uh, they would use remittance companies because banks did not see any benefit in sending these smaller amounts of money in such a so, so far away. 
So these remittances com companies were offering a, a service at a premium, of course, uh, but you could see a lot of exaggerations. So 10, 15 years ago, you could still hear prices of 15, 20% cost. And the only alternative to send money to your family back home. Uh, obviously, that has generated uh, a lot of controversy. And I believe this is also why the international community came around this and why the cost issue is actually on the SDGs today to bring the cost of remittances down from what it was originally to at least, we believe, 3%, something more normal. But this is what has captured, I think, the attention of so many is the incredible cost. But as I say, I, I, we believe that what is behind is much more than that. There's contributions from, uh, from uh, families back home and, and the, how, how, how long goes $200? And I think to understand this, we need to, to understand the, the road of $200. The migrant working in the US, you mentioned in New York, Dominicans or Salvadorians in Washington DC, every community uh, has their their uh, host country has the community of migrants. Normally on average, what we've seen through numerous studies is that the mi migrants will send at least 15% of their earnings in remittances. 10% will be saved in some way or another and 75% will stay in the host countries. So migrants in the US will spend 75% of their income in the country. Only a tiny fraction, 15% will go as remittances. But these remittances will go a long way because for the receiving families, that 15% corresponds to a whopping 60% of their income. And that's again an average. There's some countries or some families where it's the entire income that is receiving remittances. Obviously it's not optimal, but at least it shows you how important this is. And if you take that 60% and you ask, well, how do you use this? Uh, every survey of every migrant community around the world will show you more or less the same thing. 75% is used for immediate needs. And as we like to call it, to achieve their own SDGs, their daily SDGs. And these are SDGs to address the poverty that the family is facing that have to push for migration, to put food on the table, medicine, education for, for, for kids. And yes, sometimes these remittances are to pay for a birthday to buy a new color TV, like I believe anyone in this, uh, in this meeting today, or to buy some shoes. Yes, that as well. Uh, but the remaining of that 75%, the 25% is spent actually for education. It empowers women. Half of the senders are women, half of the recipients as well. It, it, it provides access to clean water. Uh, actually the biggest, and I'm sure few people know this, uh, the, the, the biggest investment in climate adaptation is done by migrant families, uh, remittances recipients. Part of the remittances is, may, is to address this, to adapt to, to the climate uh, that is affecting the lives of these of this families. So this is the reality of the $200 that we need to, to, to look at. And when we understand that, we can start thinking, well, where is there a problem? And the problem, there, there are several, I think, that sometimes are not really well assessed. The first is remittances is not the culprit of some problem here that oftentimes is saying, well, remittances can lead to inflation or other things. Uh, remittances are resulting of migration, which in turn is also resulting for the lack of economic opportunities back home. And that could be generated by many things, climate being one, uh, war, destitution, economic crisis, there's many of that. And Remittances is part of that circle. The remittances will go back home to sustain. If leveraged, uh, they could go a long way. If not leveraged, that vicious circle would continue. And we often and sadly see that many times among the entire migrant community across the world is that migrants move temporarily abroad to support their families, but without a plan, they're not able to go back to their families, which every survey will show you that this is the ultimate goal is to be united with their family. And, and we realize that this is where there's something that, that is actually wrong. Something that could be supported is how can we maximize the impact at a family level that these remittances have? And, 
and this is a good time to say is why EFAD. I mean, I think you you discussed it at the beginning by saying uh, the, the importance of these flows uh, for an institution of EFAD dedicated to rural poverty. And it is true, more than half of the flows go to rural areas. Uh, and when we discover this, uh, we realize that if there was no remittances, the world would really, and particularly the developing world, would be faced with major consequences in rural areas that could not address all the challenges that uh, that they that they have. And this is something that is absolutely crucial. And when we are looking at this, we realize also that remittances can provide further development impacts. And and this is on not only how the remittances are used, but what remittances can bring to the families. And by this, I mean financial inclusion. Most of the remit migrants and particularly their families are financially excluded, meaning that they're not part of the financial systems. Uh, they're, they're not aware or they don't have access to products and services that anybody in this meeting uh, has access to. And I'm meaning credit, savings, insurance, pensions. These are all things that for most of the remittance families, uh, it's unheard of. They do not have access to that. Well, remittances can bridge that gap. And that's what we, at IFAD, we realized uh, pretty early. Where we realized that a financial institution is not interested in remittance families because first they didn't understand that these remittances are recurrent. Uh, they think it's a one-time thing. This is all for consumption. Uh, that's maybe the biggest mistake in the rhetoric that we've been hearing for two decades. Remittances are for consumption. As we say, no, there's for their day, day the SDGs. We need to help to give more options to these remittances. And, and I think this is where we can help. This is where uh, what we've seen is financial institutions that realize that maybe this could be a good client base. You have rural financial institutions struggling to, to, to make a buck uh, for a living and, and not taking into account all these people receiving remittances, sometimes their own clients. They just don't take, and they, they struggle to give them to do a credit worthiness on this client, not taking into account this $200 foreign currency that this family is receiving every month as a collateral, for instance. Uh, and, and, and this simple miscalculation multiplied by all the people that are receiving remittances is a big missed opportunity. And this is uh, one of the things that, that we realized pretty soon that with the right and adequate financial literacy programs, we can extrapolate more on the needs of migrant families. Many of them require more service now. It's true that they're better off than those that don't receive remittances, that it is true. But they oftentimes are in communities where the community can benefit from those receiving remittances, creating more economic activity around them. And what we see with financial services is this, their aspirations to credit is greater. So creating products that link remittances with savings, by that I mean, oh, you receive remittances where if you can save 10% of that each time, after a certain period of time, you, you, will, um, you will be able to receive a credit from us. And maybe I can do some insurance product for you. And if you bring competition to this process, it becomes even more, more uh, affordable, let's say for the remittance families. What I'm discussing and what I'm saying here is not futuristic. This has been happening. And it's not been happening just in Africa, in Asia, and Latin America. This happened in Europe in the 90s. These products have been provided by today countries in the European Union, banks that decided to tap on the clients, on, on citizens that were abroad, that were interested in coming back home. They migrated abroad to be better off, but they, their dream was to come back home. Uh, I, can, I can speak about many Southern European countries, Portugal, Spain, Italy, that actually had received and still receive today a significant amount of remittances. Commercial banks were very interested in tapping in, into that. And interesting enough, what we saw at the end of the 90s, you had commercial banks in Europe offering remittances at zero cost. So I make a little pause here, zero cost. The SDG is calling for 3%. In 1990, banks were doing it at zero. How could that be? Well, simply because as you know, with a commercial bank, nothing is for free. Well, nothing was for free here, but there was an economic analysis saying uh, remittances, the transaction cost of remittances is so low. The marginal cost is a quarter of a cent in systems uh, like we have today between the US and, and Europe. 
So that's not where the money really is. Now, what's interesting is a migrant that wants to come home, build a home, he's going to need all the financial products that he could, have, that, that, he, that he will need. And, and this is what we want. We want to increase our client base with those clients. And it worked. And this lesson learned, this was not a lesson learned from many institutions across the world. And that's what Arifat we're trying to do. We're trying to leverage this, uh, this economic aspect by trying to provo- provide more access to remittances, making it easier to, re- to, to, to receive these remittances in rural areas, like engaging with microfinance institutions, with postal networks, partnerships between commercial banks and, uh, and, uh, and local financial institutions to get these remittances. And once it's done, how can we link this with other financial services? savings, credit, insurance. And if we can support the migrant community, I mean, the, the, the remittance recipient community with financial literacy, it works. These objectives works. You start aggregating all the people that could benefit, then you suddenly realize the tremendous impact that this can have. And, and this is what IFAD has been trying to, 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 to promote. Of course, we've been testing this type of products. Uh, as, as the market evolves, as, as the trends evolves, uh, as you mentioned before, digitalization has been a big, uh, a big push during this COVID crisis. And indeed, uh, digital remittances are the single most impactful, we can say, uh, phenomenon that will push financial inclusion. And we talk a lot about digitalization. Digital remittances is going to lead the way as remittances has led the way also for financial financial services. At IFAD, we've tested now more than 50 projects in 60 countries to prove, and particularly with the private sector, to prove that there's a win-win here. You can be pro-poor and pro-profit at the same time. And this is a game changer for many financial institutions. So, uh, of course, I'm not going to give you a lot, many of these 50 examples, but uh, the, the, the reality today is it's changing. We have many players. The, the, the ecosystem on remittances has changed drastically. Uh, you have a lot of, of parties that can play, but what is needed is also an enabling environment. And this is why it is so important that uh, the public sector regulators are involved in this process to look at remittances in, in different ways for what they really are, not just the risk for, finance, for money laundering or terrorist finance, as it is the case, uh, although there's very few proof that is actually because the amounts are too small and that's another story, but, but to look at the reality, I think this was embodied pretty well during the first days of the crisis when the secretary general uh, addressed the impact in developing countries. His first words uh, in relation to the impact was the potential reduction of remittances to developing countries as something catastrophic. And indeed, it would have been. The resilience of one billion people has made it otherwise. We saw that the fact that people could not send in the first few weeks a sharp decline, but many, many found a way because you have to find a way because it's your family. This is about remittance family. This is not some sort of investment that you do. You're investing in your family. This has a priority over, over everything. And then in the first few months, we saw a spike in digital remittances and that proved once again, the resilience. While all other flows go down, remittances in times of crisis go up. And, and it reflects, I think, the nature. And I, this, this, is, this is why this flow, I think, is so fundamental. I will finish with, with, uh, with the fact that, interesting enough, we, we talk about this, uh, the, the, this phenomenon, about all the investments uh, that, uh, that, that occur this remittances is counter-cyclical and has so much more to give beyond what it is already doing. And, and I think this is the, 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 the importance for international organization, member states to understand and to try to support again. And that's what, if we achieve this, I believe we can maximize the impact of development that remittances can have. And, and we can address at the root of the problem the realities that push people to migrate as well. So as IOM often says, then if remittances achieve their, their definite objective, then migration can be uh, uh, a choice rather than a necessity as it is for millions of people today. I, I will stop here for, for now and, and maybe make myself available for, for specific questions that uh, 
that's in my, my presentation. My reason. That was amazing. Both of you, <laughs> that was a lot, a lot of information, but it was really fascinating stuff. Um, for those of you who are watching the webinar right now, if you would like to pose your questions in the chat box, I will go ahead and moderate those for both of our speakers. Um, but feel free to pose questions in that chat box. Uh, and while you're thinking and perhaps writing your questions, I have a couple. I always like to take moderator's privilege. It's one of the, the things about being in charge is because I get to ask the questions I want to ask. Um, but I have one clarifying, maybe two clarifying questions uh, for you, Pedro, and then one question for both Vinny and Pedro together. Um, so just a couple of things. One, one of the things that you said, Pedro, was that diaspora investment is just as important as the, as the actual remittances. Can you give us some examples of what that diaspora re investment is and how that differs from the actual remittances? Because you said that there's a distinction between the two. I'm just curious if you could clarify that a little bit for us. Um, the second question I have for you, Pedro, is um, you talked about, I, th I think your exact quote was, without a plan, they will not be able to return, right? So you have a lot of these overseas foreign workers that leave because they think, well, I have to send money back to my family, but they don't have a plan. Um, and so therefore, then they get stuck, if you will, abroad. Um, can you... Uh, like what, what, what would a plan look like, right? Like what are some best Absolutely. examples? How, how are governments trying to help people with that plan, et cetera? Absolutely. Um, and, then the, and then following those two clarifying questions for both of you, um, because this is the Commission on the Status of Women, you had mentioned, Pedro, that 50% of the overseas foreign workers and 50% of the re recipients are, are women, right? Which goes, to, I mean, we're pretty much 50-50 in society. Um, but uh, are there differences in the way that remittance is used by women versus men? Um, I was reading a stat somewhere that said with, uh, with foreign seas, or excuse me, with, with any kind of aid, if you give it to the mother and the family um, versus the father and the family, giving $1 to a mother is like giving $10 to a, a father because fathers will spend most of the money on themselves versus mothers will spend most of the money on their family. So is there, are there differences in how women and men treat both the remittances that they send abroad and how, from abroad and how they use it in their, in their own countries, right? Uh, so those are my three clarifying questions while people pose their other questions and then we'll start uh, moderating those a bit. But if you, if you could start with those ones. Sure, with pleasure. Uh, I differentiate remittances and diaspora investment. Uh, these are part of the migrants' contributions. Um, the, the, the reason of remittances, remittances are very specific. Uh, as I mentioned, I did the dichotomy of supporting the daily needs, and this is directed at their families. This is why, yes, remittances is imperative. During the crisis, people had to send their remittances because of the nature of this flow. Diaspora investment is another kind of support that migrants, uh, some of the diaspora that are there longer term or better off uh, that are in, in host countries send in support of the communities back home. Uh, these are oftentimes migrants that have two countries, two, uh, two, um, two sides of roots, let's, let's say. Now, why we differentiate this is because the phenomenon itself and how we can support it is different. When you're trying to do diaspora investment, uh, you're often looking or you can do a parallel with uh, impact investors um, because diaspora investors, well, the, with the only caveat that uh, the, the, the traditional impact investor will look for a return and to have a social impact. The diaspora investor wants to have a social impact and then if possible, make some return into it to redo it. So it's the same ingredients with the different priorities Therefore, what we see is that maybe some products could be created for the diaspora. There's a lot for the impact investors uh, right now going on for them to facilitate this. Very little is done for the diaspora that wants to invest back home. And, 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 and there's a lot to be said about that. But again, the nature of the flow itself is different. And this is why we try not to mix it. Uh, it is part of the contributions. And I want to say again, migrant contribution goes also beyond financial. 
there's a lot of in kind that is that is uh, that is done belonging to two economies two countries when they go back home they're connected much more than before so this is this is even a whole different uh, different uh, different discussion but it is important operation to differentiate the, the the two in terms of savings diasporas has around half a trillion dollars too so it just gives you an indication of the potential that they have the you mentioned the plan and indeed that's the very sad story and if you heard during my presentation i talked a lot about financial literacy and and every i mentioned also that we did 50 projects every single project that did not have a solid base on supporting financial literacy to the beneficiaries of our project has failed because not many migrants have new needs in terms of services but they need to be adequately let's say trained to be able to use those and uh, and many uh, in desperation had to leave their families to be able to send money and then we will see and that's the reality for millions of people you mentioned about the philippines there's a lot of filipinos here in italy i particularly spoke with so many of them and the sad story is always the same thing is many thank or a particular woman i will not name her name but uh, she was saying I left the Philippines to send money to my young daughter so she could go to school. I thought it would be three to five years maximum as long, you know, so she would get her education. At the end of the day, uh, the daughter had then more needs as well. And so the mother continues sending. And now she's sending money to her granddaughter. And she's saying, I'm helping, but what's the purpose of all this? I, I spend my life not raising my daughter and now not seeing my granddaughter. I see her, it's true, uh, through the web, but, and when I travel over there, but I need to maintain this. So this is, this is a caveat, a reality for many migrants as well. Having a plan, and in some of the projects that we did with the Filipinos is this, it even has a name. With the Filipinos, we call it the dream map, is seating with the migrants and calculated, what is your objective? You need to send home, how much would it be to be investing home so they're better off so you can actually at some point return, you know, and we can go starting with savings. Many of the diasporas, the Filipinos didn't know how to say no. So families ask you and you send. Well, one of the first training was when to say no and how to save. The results were amazing in terms of the savings capability of migrants, what they were able to do. And with that adequate approach to things, they were able to say they would actually able to sustain their families and invest back home, preparing their return. Many, and name me one, one community, and I will tell you that a big chunk of them would like to retire in their home communities. And they would like to have the same facilities and maybe, and that's why they would like also to invest in their home communities. So when they retire, they're in a better place than the when they left. And this is the truth across everything. And particularly, as you say, with women, I said 100 million women uh, and 100 million men are sending remittances. We can see on the recipient is the same. It is true that there's a lot of challenges, depending if you're a woman or a man. Uh, in the use, it's true. Uh, women are better savers than, than men. I mean, it, it comes across everywhere, but they're also facing many more challenges. Uh, when we're talking about digitalization, we're seeing women also struggling uh, with, with certain barriers. And, and we can say, yeah, but it's equal. Well, the issues are not equal. And this is what we need to look at. And this is why in every single program that we do, we differentiate, be it the sender or the recipient being a woman or not, because that's another set of problems that need to be integrated. For men or for women, that creates a whole package and it needs to be like, doing like that. And the service needs to be appropriate as well. I hope I, I addressed no, for sure, for sure. Vinny, Vinny, what can you add? I think you're muted, Vinny. You're muted. Okay, I unmuted myself now. Uh, let me repeat. <laughs> uh, I just uh, want to add a word about uh, the diaspora part. Uh, there is such a thing as diaspora bonds uh, actually, uh, Israel was the one that pioneered it. And these are bonds that are directed to um, their nationals who are living and working overseas and presumably have some money to spare. 
So, and to invest. So why not buy State of Israel bonds? And I think a few years ago, uh, Nigeria, if I remember correctly, also issued a bond like that, uh, trying to reach um, nationals uh, working and living abroad to uh, invest via these bonds uh, in various projects uh, in, in, um, in, in that country. And um, I'd like to add one, one other thing about uh, remittances. Um, a few years ago, actually in 2017, uh, EFID and others uh, sponsored their annual um, meeting on um, uh, known as GFRID, right? Uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> conference. Global on, Forum Remittances. Yeah, Global <laughs> Forum on Investments, Remittances, and Development. Um, I was, uh, it was in New York in 2017, and of course I attended. And uh, I was sitting next to a Filipino lady who um, had a money transfer agency in uh, Miami. And she had only two offices, but one of them she put right in the port of Miami. So as soon as the boats docked and the sailors, the Filipino sailors came off, she nabbed them to get them to send money home before they could go to bars and whatnot. And, you know, spend money on uh, wine, women, and song, as the expression goes. Um, and uh, I'd like to ask a question about the money transfer agents, uh, which are so important in, uh, in, in sending money, uh, remitting money back home. Um, the United States a few years ago cracked down on uh, money transfers, uh, uh, ag agents, uh, because of uh, money laundering considerations. And, um, a lot of them severed their links with banks, so making uh, transactions very uh, costly and uh, difficult. Uh, has this been, uh, let me ask you, Pedro, uh, has this been um, uh, a hindrance to sending money, at least out of the United States, where there has been this concern? Sure. Um, yes, I, I'm trying to find my words because I, we need to be polite. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it does. And all considerations are taken into account. Obviously, there were some concerns about that. But it's the, it's the lack of information that, 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 that pushes one belief more than the other. I think it is important to have the whole picture. The concerns uh, about money laundering after September 11, uh, it was a great concern in the, in the US uh, because it was thought that uh, it, was, it was very difficult to trace the money uh, from these remittance companies. They're not financial institutions. It appears that none of the terrorists actually use the money transfer companies. They use Visa, MasterCard, and, and full-fledged bank accounts. But that's another story. The, the, the point is, nevertheless, this could be of a concern. And, uh, and therefore, in order to de-risk, uh, they increase the level of, of, of security and scrutiny. That, of course, comes with a cost. What happened is that many banks, rather than assessing the risk that really their, their clients might pose on that, they just decided to cut the money transfer accounts. So you had remittances companies not having an account to function anymore. And the, the, the collateral damage of this is obviously the remittance, the families not being able to send. And if you remember before I said that the most important thing in for, a, for a migrant is to send money home to their families. Well, if they cannot do it in one way, it is like water. It will find a way because we are talking about your loved ones, simply put. So money, if it cannot go there, it will go informally. Anybody, I think, in this panel, it has a member that a family member abroad or elsewhere that needs money for an emergency and dearest to you, it, you're, you're going to find a way to send. And if this is a friend that is traveling to the place where your family member is, you're going to give an envelope with the cash and you're going to say, please deliver this to my family. And that's it. And, and this has happened by the millions. So, and this ultimately goes under the radar, and I think it's not in the interest of any uh, economy or any nations of doing that. So, commensurate the risk was something that was not done right then with the, you know, with the emergencies of addressing this. I think now member states have come a long way since then. There's still a lot of issues. Uh, the, the, this AML, CFT, anti-money laundering and counter-finance terrorism measures are still a reality. But more and more, and this is why this type of events are, are important, is to understand what are we talking about? This is the remittances and the families behind this human story is extremely important. And it's very, very difficult 
to do to to do your shadow business around remittances simply because you need a lot of people involved uh you know if you want a money laundering uh, remittances remember you're not sending thousands you're sending 200 dollars and if you say if one person sends to a thousand persons, you have a lot of red lights coming in. And if you have a thousand people sending to one person, a lot of red lights come in. So that means you need to have a lot of people involved in all this. It's just nuts. It's better to have one crook lawyer here and a banker and you can try to do it. What I'm trying to say is with more information as we discuss this, uh, these issues and, and more the reality of one billion people comes to, comes to bear, uh, the easier it will be to, to address this. I think technology today is, is a, has been a game changer. Uh, the, the, the Filipino in the boat right now, who will, will be able to do it through the internet connection that he has. He doesn't need to, to lay in the port. He can have an e-wallet. He could actually already destine some of these funds to pay some of the expenses. He can do this with his wife or his wife with a husband that stay behind in the case of the Filipinos, because we see this as well. So the potential is huge. Financial inclusion comes really handy in there to support these new financial needs and need for knowledge from, uh, from, uh, from these remittance families. And if we do that, we can really, again, achieve so much. And for once, this is a development problem that doesn't need money. If you think of it, every single other development problem that you can bring on that we deal with at the United Nations has a problem, has a, has a money problem. This one hasn't. Isn't that beautiful? And it has an, a huge impact. So this is, I think, for all of us to reflect on, on, on its importance. I, I hope I answered your, your question. For sure. Um, I want to I want to go back. You told us the story about the woman who thought she would be overseas for three to five years and then is now been there considerably longer than that because now she's supporting her granddaughter, right? Um, a number of the questions that have come in through the chat have focused on the effects of the family of this separation, right? Um, where oftentimes the mother may be away for years, um, leaving the kids to be raised by granddaughter or by aunts, etc. cetera. Um, and so a couple of questions there, what are some policies uh, that you have seen, some best practices that you have seen uh, to, to make sure that the family does not remain unconnected, right? To make sure that even if there's a physical separation, that there's still a cohesive family unit um, besides just, you know, the, the $200 coming in every, every month. Um, and has latest advances in technology kind of mitigated that separation a bit um, because of, uh, you know, Facebook, Zoom, you know, ways of FaceTime, ways of being able to, to have a relationship despite the physical distance. Sure. Uh, you know, this is not a rosy story uh, at the end of the day. Uh, families are by nature, I think in the definition of many, meant to be together. Uh, that's what constitutes, I think, the, the, the family, a real family or human beings that consider the other next to them family. Um, I, I'm not an expert in the family definition or etymology. I just have a feeling, I think, like other millions of people. Being away from the family, from the ones you love, is something very difficult. The challenges and, and, uh, and the sacrifices of so many in leaving their loved one behind that actually mean, mean the world to them, to leave them behind so they can provide for them, it's more, maybe one of the most difficult decisions that can be made. And, and this is a reality. There's a lot of sad stories. The person that I was talking to, there were a lot of tears involved in this discussion. Why? Because their loved ones were, were abroad. And, and it's the realization that maybe something went wrong in the planning. The need to support the family was there. There was no question about it. They reached a point where I don't have a choice. I want to support my family. I have to. This is why I'm sometimes upset when we say remittances is just casual for TV, color TV, shoes, and birthdays. It's more than that. I think it's an insult to so many that are doing this sacrifice. That I think it's extremely important to understand and to change our narrative around that. Now, past that. How can we help minimize that time? And these were the things that I was discussing about, financial literacy, support, let them plan, 
So you do that sacrifice. You work enough for your savings to for your retirement, and that's it. But with no future foreseeable end to this process, it is a problem. And the social aspect, social the social issues that run out of this are tremendous indeed. At least this is not like it was a hundred years ago, where you would leave and you would send a letter from the Americas back to Ireland saying, "I've been here fine, you know." And every de decade, but you know, a total disconnect. Nowadays, you know exactly the trouble that your family is going through. You know exactly what happened in school because you're connected almost, you know, three, four times and every day even more. It's like as, may, as, as much as anybody else. And so that reality is with you. Uh, it's great that we can gather here virtually today, but I think we will all appreciate more in person. So there's a limit to these things. And I think the family, the remittance families, uh, like anyone else, feel exactly the same. So it is extremely important to think ahead. And I think this is where governments can support. This is where international organizations need to put this in the plans. You would be amazed at how many member states still today have not seen the potential that remittances have to basically financial, to promote financial inclusion to promote development in rural areas. A lot remains to be done and the potential again is here. So this is why it's so important to bring this, this, uh, this phenomenon to bear, to understand it better and to include this in policy decisions and uh, it, beyond remittances, obviously, because one thing, one more thing that I wanted to say is interesting enough, remittances is like fiduciary uh, aspects. It connects with so many. Uh, so many topics are connected to this. Empowerment of women is here. Climate change issues are there. And you realize often that there's, there's so many. Access to food. We are going to go to a new food insecurity, a tremendous one right now. The crisis that is currently happening in Eastern Europe is affecting tremendously families in Central Asia that depended remittances from Russia that now uh, have seen their remittances cut in half from one day to another because of the devaluation of the ruble. And we're talking about families being, uh, uh, be, being impacted by this. We need to have remittances now address and solidify resilience. So bringing other financial products linked to remittances builds resilience. And that I think is the word of the day, of the decade to, to come until this is really taken is promote resilience through remittances and, and I believe that in that, we will then achieve a lot of the goals that we have in the, in the SDGs. So if I may. I was going to say, your colleague, your colleague Viviana, has been answering questions okay. in the chat. And she raised her hand and wanted to, to make a quick statement. Yes, I'm really, actually, I'm really happy to see so many people in this meeting. Um, and, uh, of course, this meeting happening. Uh, just quickly, to emphasize what Pedro was saying before. There are models that have that, that support um, psychosocial, um, well, that, that provide psychosocial support to uh, remittance recipients. Uh, but that is a very expensive model, the way it's been done, because it, it has to be done normally one to one or small groups, etc. So it has been financed by a lot of bilateral donors like the, the Swiss. Uh, the Swiss uh, government and some NGOs like in the Philippines, they have incorporated that part into the financial education uh, strategy. And that is a model that we've been sort of replicating whenever it's possible, because mm -hmm. when you work with the private sector, it's very difficult to inculcate this type of support because obviously they're looking for business and um, the work of NGOs that work around uh, remittance families is key in this aspect. So I, would, I just wanted to emphasize that, that it, it, it is done, it's done in many countries, but still the, 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 the scope is very small. And hopefully it's something that we can, um, you know, uh, further disseminate as a good practice. Thank you. Thank you for jumping in there, Bibiana. Um, one of the questions that we got early on, uh, and it goes away from the psychosocial and it goes more to the country policy uh, aspect of remittances is what policies have countries implemented to be more supportive of family remittances? And do these policies differ based on whether remittance payments are going into or out of the country? So how's the United States, for example, which I would imagine, and you could correct me on that, is more a net exporter of remittances, if you will. 
Um, how would those policies have been enacted to be more supportive of family remittances in general? And then the recipient countries, how, what are some best practices that you can mention for us, Pedro? Absolutely. Um, and, and I think today, this year is a good time to talk about that. I wouldn't have said so in 2017. Uh, and I will explain myself in a second. The, the, the truth is, depending if you're sending or receiving country, you look at the problems at that end. For many of the sending countries, remittances has been an issue of cost. We realized that to send remittances, it cost a big premium. And, and this is why it was raised uh, many years ago, particularly by sending countries, because this is where the price, the cost is born. So this is how many governments were acquainted. This is why you have it in the SDGs. It is a good indicator, but it should not be an objective by itself, if you think of it. But it's a very good indicator because the day the prices are down, that means there is enough competition, there's enough innovation around it, and many more families are going to benefit from it. So uh, what we've seen uh, is you need to understand, uh, the G if you take the G20 as a group, they basically represent 85% of the global remittances sent to developing countries. And, uh, and the issue being cost, and we need to make sure that it's safe and so on. On the receiving side, many are saying all these flows, how can we tap into that? And that's a difficult thing to say. Sometimes governments decided, why don't we tax it? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the worst idea if you wanna be reelected anywhere. Uh, and at the end of the day, because these are private flows, mm -hmm. And, uh, and basically it's not really worked on that. I mean, you can try, but this, if you wanna have an underground market, uh, you do it. Uh, and, and, and we realize that many of the migrants feel like they have left because the, their country could not give them the socioeconomic, you know, security that they needed and therefore had to do this big sacrifice we just discussed about, about leaving your loved ones behind. And then on top of that, now they're gonna tax you. This is not a friendly discussion. So what we realize, and, and this is, I think, where IFAD has been very active with many other partners, and we just hope that much, many more will come and help is to support receiving countries in addressing this issue, let's say in the smart way. And the smart way, for instance, is understanding really the phenomenon of remittances for development purposes, for instance, like financial inclusion, as I just mentioned. Do you have a financial inclusion strategy? Include remittances. Make it, make it better for the remittances actors in the country to link this with other services. Insurance, for instance. On the sending side, what we've been saying to countries the United States is please also think about the impact that this is having on the receiving side. How you can also create, make the families that receive remittances better off with these flows by linking it also with financial, stimulating this financial inclusion. Therefore, you're gonna create less incentives to migrate, at least more choices, but less necessities. And I'm very happy to say that over the last, uh, the crisis, the, the, the COVID pandemic, has made a drastic change, I think, in the international community. At least this is the impression uh, or the feeling that we had at IFAD. Uh, we are implementing partners of the G20 Global uh, Financial Inclusion, uh, Global Platform for Financial Inclusion, GPFI. And I'm very happy to say that all the member states that have a remittance plans for the first time have really included in their equation a, a, a picture of the other side. We think in terms of corridors, the US is the largest one sending to many countries, but now member states that have received migrants and where remittances are coming from are thinking also on the countries of destination and how to maximize those. And this is a game changer, I think, for both the remittance, the 1 billion people involved and all the development issues. This is, this is happening. So member states of the G20 are thinking beyond the cost. Now the narrative about financial inclusion making a bigger bang for the buck of remittances uh, is included in their policies. And same wise on the receiving side, we see member states now, we see central banks um, including remittances in their financial inclusion strategy. We didn't happen uh, or very rarely in, uh, in, in a few years back. So this has changed. And I think this is one way, for instance, that we can maximize their impact among many others, of course, but I would need more time. <laughs> Of course, but but I think it's interesting because I mean you're bringing a lot of the changes that have happened because of the pandemic, or as yes. people have recognized different uh, financial trends during the pandemic, and 
and it's just not something that I've ever thought of before, but I think it's absolutely fascinating. Um, moving in, in, in kind of a different, different matter, um, and it's a little away from the actual cash flow to the actual overseas foreign worker um, and support for that OFW. Um, if I can find the exact question, uh, this is from Anna Monroe, who, who asks, what are the main barriers to the integration of migrants within host countries and how can these be overcome, right? And so you have countries sometimes with significant OFW populations, um, but the overseas foreign workers may be looked down upon or seen as you're only here to take our money. Yeah. And you try to dispel some of that by saying that 75% of the money is still staying in the host country, right? Um, but how, uh, what, are, what are some barriers to integrating migrants? What are countries trying to do to mitigate those barriers? Um, how, how is that support for the actual OFW in, their, in the host country um, being demonstrated? This is obviously a very challenging question uh, that you might have, uh, and it's somewhat uh, a different issue. There's even another day just for that, International Migrants Day, right? Uh, that, uh, that my December. migrants, this is a day to recognize our needs, our problems. Uh, in the International Day of Family Remittances, we recognize them uh, with, with the work that they're doing and it only belongs to them, all the credit goes for them. But it's true that uh, the issue of, of migration, integration, it, it is a global one. Uh, there's no easy solution. As you know, there's many processes at the UN. We can talk about the Global Compact on Migration uh, with its 20 objectives. Uh, a lot of the issues are in there. Um, some very difficult to address. Uh, some that I believe some member states don't want to recognize. Th there's a lot of things attached to it. The equation that we look from IFAD trying to support the countries of origins, because that's mainly what, what, what we do. Uh, we work with our partners, IOM, that is very involved in that side of the equation. We are mainly working on the receiving side or the countries of origin of these migrants. Uh, but it is true that that is uh, that is indeed very challenging, uh, very challenging questions. But as I say, the equation that we see is that uh, millions of people leave their home countries because of need, but they go where jobs are present, where their labor is needed. And, and this is a very simple equation. When we saw the crisis in the US, we saw the migration from Mexico reduced from one day to another. It's not that there were flux of migrants suddenly without jobs, it's because uh, there was connectivity. And many migrants in the US were saying to their relatives, there's no, no one is looking for a job here. I mean, there's no, they're not looking for workers. Don't even bother, don't come. Uh, so this is the reality that we're seeing. Politics aside is uh, there, there's an equation here that works when you need labor and if you can get it cheaper in a globalized economy, this is, this is going to happen. now. In that, there will be a lot of inadequacies, I, I believe, obviously, in terms of, of right of situation uh, that, uh, that are very challenging to, to address. I don't know if I'm the most qualified person to, to try to address those, but, uh, but it is in, very important to understand that this come along as well uh, as we address the contributions of migrants, because they're doing all these contributions despite all these issues uh, that they are facing on a, in terms of migration and in their host country. So we're almost to our time. So I'm gonna ask one last question for both of you is, is just if you could tell me the, the one misconception in your brain, the biggest misconception people have about remittances and the one thing that you want us to remember from today's discussion. I think I already said it, remittances, this consumption, consumption thing, remittances for consumption. This is my personal opinion. I've been on remittances 2000, since 2001. Uh, I work at IFAD. Prior to that, we were working. I was working at Inter-American Development Bank, where I think the organization that pushed for this, the the linkage with remittances as consumption, is by leaders, by uh, heads of of private sector entities, the biggest misconception that leads to wrong business approach to this. 
miss opportunities and wrong development policies, miss opportunities. So I believe that this is the, there's many others, but if I would put one uh, that, that can be traced and trickle down into very everlasting barriers is the misconception of what remittances are. Vinny? Well, I think the uh, what stands out, I mean, as an economist, I have to point to dollars. <laughs> uh, the fact that uh, remittances are close to uh, a trillion dollars, they'll probably be reach that in a couple of years, uh, is so significant. And uh, what's important is that this money goes directly into the hands of the poor, whereas uh, uh, foreign aid, you know, is dispersed through governments and maybe some of it goes uh, to uh, line the pockets of government officials because there is a great deal of corruption in uh, all you have to do is read some of the Transparency International studies that are done all the time. Um, so a lot of the money destined for development of these poor countries uh, ends up lining the pockets of politicians, uh, unfortunately. But Remittances go directly into the hands of the poor, and the poor are solving their own poverty. All right. And with that, I just want to take a moment to thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Vinny, for your remarks today. Thank you to the permanent mission of the Philippines uh, for Ambassador Manalo's remarks at the top of the meeting. Um, like I said, I have found this discussion very, very fascinating today. Um, my brain is still reeling a little bit and just so many, there's so many aspects to this that I had never considered before. So thank you very much, both of you um, for that. I just want to take a moment to highlight that our next meeting of the NGO Committee on the Family in New York will take place on April 28th, uh, which is the fourth Thursday in April. Uh, it is our annual uh, our annual intern presentation. We work with a bunch of interns with uh, um, APA and ICP, and they'll be presenting to us. It's it's one of our traditional events every April, um, and we're excited for that. Uh, and other oh, and finally, and Vinny will be happy with this. If you are interested in joining our committee, the NGO Committee on the Family in New York, please visit ngofamilyny.org slash join. Um, and we would be happy to have you as members. Uh, and I'm actually going to put that in the chat right now so that you don't even have to remember that link. <laughs> uh, but anyway, but it was a very, very fascinating uh, presentation today. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, especially Pedro for, as, as you said, as Vinny said, postponing your dinner to be with us. Mm -hmm. And finally, no, it was a pleasure. Thank you so finally, much. Finally, I think for me, you talked, uh, Pedro, about how the remittances are used to achieve daily SDGs and personal SDGs. I kind of look at remittances as daily FDI or personal FDI um, in that minor way um, to, to both build economy and to build resilience and to strengthen, strengthen the economic means for families. But thank you all, and we will see you in a few weeks. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much, so much for the invitation. Have a good evening and a good day. Sorry. And a good, good day to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>